Uh, back in the studio, recording the dead zone. And, yep, it's going to be one of these recordings of the meditation from the studio. So, it would be really cool if I could use this somehow to get some audio, but I um, haven't yet figured that one out. That's high tech. Okay, so it's PPM meditation number 40 two or 43 somewhere in there I can check it but it'll it doesn't really matter it was originally written this date in history which was uh, Mar is, is March the 27th it's two, 2014 so 10 years ago today I wrote um, the, what I'm about to read so it's a remember for those of you just tuning in this is a uh, commemoration of a year uh, of, a, of, a, of a year long experiment that I undertook in a really it involved the experiment was how can one do philosophy differently how can one do philosophy of education differently how can one undertake to examine the question of philosophy of education of making philosophy of education in a way that's different uh, that is not you know making an argument per se in the form of an article or that has this grand design of a book uh, it was sit down every day uh, and pursue the question the question being the one that I came back to in yesterday, which is, you know, I came back to it because it's the beginning of a new chapter, chapter four, and that in a certain sense was a part of the design that emerged, and that's the question concerning um, how is it that we can get turned around and tuned on, in, tuned into be beings presencing. That is to say, how can we uh, uh, experience an effacement, uh, non-mediated direct experience with human freedom? Uh, and, 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 the, and the potentiality of human freedom such that we are inspired to do something with that. So that's really the question that it was pursued and the enactment, the writing itself was an answer to that. I mean that's really what it boils down to is that the writing and now going back 10 years later to read the meditations that came out as the book Being and Learning, I'm going back and, and reenacting, going through the, uh, uh, the experiment again by doing this, doing this video. But 10 years ago had I had this possibility, I might have just done it as a uh, as a um, a video um, uh, uh, videotape the experiment, or I might have videotaped them as after I'd written them. Um, but in any case, ten years later, because of the uh, developments uh, in in technology, the computers, you know, we have these cameras now built into the laptops, and we have the powerful forces of uh, these these companies like Google that give us these opportunities to create uh, film and to create video and to have blogs and to intermix the two. I mean, you know, all praise Google. Yes, I'll say it. <laughs> uh, I'm very grateful, as I am grateful of WRHU and Hofstra. You know that you know this space where I can uh, also experiment. And so I'm, as you can see, very much into the technologies uh, of philosophy of, and philosophy of education, if you will, and using these different machines and tools uh, to do philosophy. So that's the experiment. And right now, in terms of the writing, to bring it back to where we were, um, we're I'm taking up the uh, Plato's Allegory of the Cave, and so we've moved from a discussion of focus on Lao Tzu uh, to, into uh, a focus on Plato's Allegory of the Cave. So, let's take it from there. I just have to be mindful of the music and where we are in terms of that progression of that. So this is The Dead Zone. It's going to be on this Sunday. And this is music from the Grateful Dead's performance. This date, actually, in history, March the 27th, 1991, performed at the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum, which is right down the street from Hofstra University, where I am. I call it the home court of the Grateful Dead. Okay, so with this reading of, with his reading of the allegory, Heidegger declares that he will make a link between the essence of truth and the essence of education. This is an important link, and it serves to provide further insights into the exploration into the relationship between being and learning that we are engaged in here. We have discovered that learning is the process through which our relationship with being unfolds. Learning signifies are being situated within being's processual unfolding, the twofold play of appearing and hiding. 
To leap into the mystery of this relationship is to be reposed by the ultimate first questions. And our response to these questions that are posed to us represents our response to being. When we are enjoined by beings to full play, we are caught in the process of learning. To be enjoined in this process, this twofold play, is to be caught within the twofold play of learning and being. Thus, we anticipate with optimism Heidegger's linking of the truth and education. For we have arrived to receive this reading with our own insights into the link between the truth of beings unfolding and the truth of learning. Quote, According to our interpretation, which is made necessary from out of a future need, the allegory not only in illustrates the essence of education, but at the same time opens our eyes to a transformation in the essence of truth. If the allegory can show both, must it not be the case that an essential relationship holds between education and truth? This relation, in fact, does, in fact, obtain. And it consists in the fact that the essence of truth and the sort of transformation it undergoes here first makes possible education in its basic structure. As we will see, Heidegger's reading is importantly focused on the process of transformation that we intuitively identify as the essence of education, the movement from darkness of ignorance into the enlightenment of knowledge. Our focus on learning as a purposeful wandering together, which gets underway with the apprentice when the apprentice is turned away from the security of self-certainty and drawn out of the domestic habitat, has identified learning as a transformative movement where the entire being of the human is turned around, transformed, dismantled, and released into the freedom of being together in the open region. Heidegger's linking the transformative process of education to the transformative process of truth, identified as the twofold play of being, will underwrite the overlap we have identified between being and learning. However, our reading will extend Heidegger's as we stress how the transform transformative nature of education and truth that is presented in Plato's allegory transforms our understanding of learning as an event experienced by a solitary individual who endures the rugged journey to the peak of enlightenment. The structure of the allegory too easily lends itself to reinforcing such a reading, and it is for this reason that the security and domestic tranquility of subjectivity has maintained such a powerful hold on the ways we have and continue to think about the modalities of learning. Taking our cue from Heidegger, then, we attempt to offer a reading of the allegory that takes up the phenomena of transformation as the crux of the matter, yet attempts to hear this story in a novel way. To be open to a novel hearing of the allegory is to hear the story as a tale of transformation and as a transformation, transforming tale, both as a tale that has the evocative power to transform its listeners and as a tale that transforms or changes in the telling. To be open to the novel hearing of the allegory is to hear the truly novelistic narrative quality of this tale, a quality that expresses novelty, improvisation, and spontaneity. To hear this quality is to understand the allegory as an improvisational context, a composition that begs to be heard in novel ways that invites us to rearrange it and thereby authentically listen to it. Because it is built upon and transformed and turns upon sudden shifts, spontaneity, unpredictability, the allegory exemplifies evocative poetic saying that offers teachability. In this sense, the allegory calls out and enjoins the listener in poetic dialogue and in enjoining us conveys the essential message that education is a relational modality where the rugged ascent to enlightenment, if we identify this as a journey of the solitary pilgrim, is perhaps only one side of the twofold play, 
significant in that it represents both the repose of the beings in relationship with being and with other beings. The culminating moment of the allegory as a tale of transformation occurs at the end of the story when the twofoldness of the twofold play is redeemed and the one-sided moment gives way to the enjoyment with others, to the recollection of the voice of others. We begin our recollection by retelling, uh, by, uh, we, reca we begin our recollection, our retelling of Plato's allegory, by recalling the context of the story. The allegory appears, as we have already noted, in the seventh book or part of Plato's Republic. What is important for us to recall first and foremost is that the short story appears within a much longer work as part of an extended dialogue on the meaning of justice. By the time we arrive at the allegory, we have already understood that justice is an ideal that could be realized in the domain of human endeavors if and when this realm were organized under the principles of republicanism. A circular argument, to be sure, for this claim rests on the capacity to identify, articulate, and finally orchestrate the realization of the principles of republicanism. Plato's response to this critique is to conjecture that such principles, if they are known at all, would be known by those who are capable of thinking beyond the tradition, beyond the confines of the inherited forms of political discourse, by the everyday and common sense ways we speak about political matters, and respond to the question, how are we to live together? This question is yet another evocative ultimate first question, a question that represents a macro articulation of the question, who are you? A question that rests on the distinction between who and what a being is. To ask, how are we to live together, is to ask, who are we? By the time Plato arrives at the allegory of the cave, he's recognized that this question can only be asked when and if the we has arrived at a location where the question can be asked as a question about the who as opposed to what. To have arrived at this location, this domain of inquiry, the field of openness where the question can be posed, means that the we has been recognized as a phenomenon to be questioned. That we exist must be recognized first and foremost as a given, but as a given that is offered as a question. Thus, to raise the question, who are we, is to recognize that we are together in some fashion, that we have arrived together at this moment, but know not precisely how we've come together, nor how it, or if we shall be together in the future. Thus, the question, if and when we arrive to the location where we can raise it, is shrouded in mystery. We arrive at this question from a nowhere and raise it in view of a not yet. We arrive from an unknown and unnameable past that constituted us as a we. This we is always already a phenomenon to be taken up, but in view of the question, but, but in view of the question remains not yet identified. This nameless other has brought us together and compels us to raise the question. This is the problem at hand that Plato takes up and offers us in his Republic and what represents the ultimate context for the allegory. And that's how it ends. So in this meditation, I'm really t getting into and taking up the question of the Republic and then the question to understand the question of the Republic is us to understand um, what the allegory is intending to demonstrate. So in a certain sense, I'm setting up the whole problem of the allegory as not a problem of individual enlightenment. Again, that would go contrary to my understanding of learning, but setting it up as the possibility of someone being able to ask the question, right? So the liberation or emancipation of the prisoner, if we know the allegory, and I'm going to go through it step by step in the days that come. But in that movement, what I'm suggesting is, is that you get to this place where there is someone who can raise the question, who are we? But that, that person is in such a place that when they arrive to ask the question, they seemed transformed. So the relationship between the emancipation of the prisoner, the cave dweller, which is their education, and their ability to ask the fundamental question are inextricably linked, right? So someone needs to ask the question, but in order to ask the question, who are we? That person needs to have been transformed. 
they need to have been taken out of what I'm calling the domestic, the repetitive, the cave, and come back into that space to then pose this question. And they pose the question immediately in terms of their affect or their modality or their, the place they're in, their ontological situation, because they appear transformed and different. As we'll see, the prisoner is recognized as this person that formerly dwelled in this place alongside others. But they are seen and understood to be different. They're changed. They're, they're transformed. So this is important. And this is what I'll be sort of situating. And this is a moment where, perhaps not in a way that satisfied some, I do take up the question of sort of the political implications of being and learning. That is to say, I hint at the political implications that follow from the forming of the learning community. Not so much that the learning community becomes this alternative space where people dwell in, you know, under equality and in relationship to their freedom together. Of course, that would be like the ideal sort of democratic space from one perspective. But it's 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 that out of that learning context and out of that learning community arises a certain kind of political subjectivity that's activated, you know, and that from that political subjectivity arises the possibility of asking the question in the political specifically political context, who are we? Now, to me this is different because the learning community, and this is something that I trace through a rent, is a non-political in the sense that it is a gathering of friends, right, first and foremost, or friendship arises in the learning community. And the intimacy of the learning community is somewhere in between the family and the political sphere, which isn't quite the state, right? So I've talked about this distinction between the state, uh, the civil society, and the family, sort of that Hegelian move. Education and the learning community and where it moves is somewhere outside of the family in the private sphere of the family. It's not yet quite the public sphere, but it's something in between. And it certainly is, is related to and protected by, quote unquote, even though in some ways challenges the state, but it's kind of far removed. So it's a space in between, but that's moving outside of both. So neither in the public sphere of the, of the, or the political sphere, as a rent might call it, nor in the uh, familial sphere or, or, or the sphere of the private sphere. It's something that's moving in the threshold, if you will, in between them. But this threshold is not in either, and this is what's important to me. So it, it has aspects of the intimacy and familial qualities um, of the family, and it has this aspect of the public sphere, but it's neither. So what's important here, though, is that it's a gathering of friends. So friends, you know, if you're friends and your family, you make this distinction. But your friends, you know better than your neighbors, right? That's the kind of the move I'm making. So out of the learning community, then uh, comes the uh, out of the gathering of friends form the learning community, and then from the learning community, we could talk about the possibility of a political subjectivity that enters into the public sphere, or insists on a public sphere, but then is now relating to others in quote unquote in the relationship of citizens, right? And so that's a different modality. And the, what I'm suggesting is is that the, the return of the uh, prisoner in the allegory of the cave is uh, the return of a, of a person who is, in a way, re-engaging his former uh, community, if you will, and it's from this level, perhaps, that we could talk of as um, uh, from a political point of view. That's not quite how I'm going to go, but I think that's, that's a move that I want to make. The other thing I want to point out, make sure my music is... It's firing them out. It's still playing. Okay, I gotta I gotta wrap this up because I gotta go to a mic break in a moment. So um, the other thing that's really important, and the thing that I'll probably make in my commentary, is this relationship between um, um, you, the Heidegger, and and how important what Heidegger, you know, the relationship between the truth, um, the essence of truth, and essence of education. And it's interesting that this is happening now a month and a half into um, um, the writing, and it's already in chapter four. So I'm in the, in the in moving into chapter four. So a significant part of the book, when it's only then that this that this I move I, I take this move towards Heidegger and his, his essay on Plato's allegory of the cave, um, where he's going to make this link between truth uh, and education. And this quotation is so important. According he says to our interpretation of the allegory, which is made necessary from out of a future need. 
So this is this is classic Heidegger that there's this sort of future that he's prognosticating, and you know I've, I've written a paper on this, and it's something that I find very important. It's throughout his uh, writing that he talks about running ahead to the past or this future. So there's this interesting aspect of time in the future. Anyway, he says, according to our interpretation, which is made necessary from out of, out of a future need, the allegory not only illustrates the essence of education, but at the same time opens our eyes to a transformation in the essence of truth. If the allegory can show both, must it not be the case that an essential relation holds between education and truth? This relation does in fact obtain. Indeed it does. And thank you, Heidegger, for phrasing it in this way and for giving me the opportunity to then take it and develop that further. So that's going to do it. It's on 20 minutes exactly and some seconds, and I'm going to wrap it up from the studio north at WRHU where I'm recording the Dead Zone and also recording the meditation from this date, the 27th of March, written originally this date in 2004 and uh, uh, re returned to you on this date in 2014, 10 years later.